really my distinct pleasure to welcome you all to the first of a series of the Spring 2016 Thought Leadership Lunch and Learns, which are hosted by the SDMI uh, Alumni Association. So it's really nice to see all of those uh, who are here with us today. How many of you are alumni? Okay, we have a couple of alumni and students, so they're great. Um, and then also, um, we're doing this uh, remotely, so we also have um, alumni who are joining us by uh, webcast as well. So welcome uh, to those of you on the webcast. So our speaker today um, is George Gooch. Uh, George is the Director of Policy and Planning for the Texas Health Services Authority, uh, where he works on law and policy related to the electronic health information exchange. George received a legal master's in health law from the University of Houston Law Center and is certified in healthcare privacy compliance by the Healthcare Compliance Association. Before joining the CHSA, George worked as a healthcare fraud and abuse attorney in Houston and as a healthcare policy analyst for the Texas State Committee on Health and Human Services. Um, so George is going to be talking about the HIE Texas. And before I ask George to start off, just a quick reminder. Um, that we have um, uh, two more Lunch and Learns already planned. One of them is going to be on March the 3rd uh, by Dr. Ramdas Menton and Jason Phipps from the Texas Medicaid Health IT team. And they're going to be talking about transforming our healthcare system uh, with the aid of health IT innovation. And on March 24th, we've got David Fulton from the Texas Health and Human Services Commission, uh, who's also an SDMI, SDMI alum. And he's going to be talking about e-prescribing of controlled sub substances. I also want to thank um, Chance Coble, Kurt Kennedy, and Jennifer Atkinson, um, who are part of um, the group, the alumni, um, who have actually organized uh, these Lunch and Learn series. So thanks very much uh, to them, and hopefully they're listening uh, remotely. So with that, please welcome uh, George. So before I get started, I know we have people here, and we have people that are they're watching via video. Where is that? Is that back there? Is that what that thing is? Okay, yeah. I only ask because I've done this before where we have dual, and I thought that I was definitely looking into the camera, <laughs> but it's just me, like, looking in. And they let me do it the whole time. And someone finally at the end was like, you know, you're not looking at us, right? And it's like, well, now I do, thanks. But um, uh, So thank you for that great introduction. Um, my name is George Gooch. I work for the Texas Health Services Authority. Um, before we get started, I'd kind of like to get to know who I'm speaking to in the audience. Um, do we have any lawyers here present? OK, good. Um, <laughs> do we have any doctors? OK, this is going to be a really good talk. We're all going to get along beautifully. Um, does anyone currently, or I know we have a lot of students here. Um, we have a few alumni. Does anyone currently work in health IT? Yeah, we got a few. What are some examples? What do you? I work in Pac. I work in Pac. Okay. 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 Great. Great. Anyone from? I saw a few hands go up in the back. Um, I'm a software developer. Working. I'm a student as well. Health informatics. Um, and I'm also a graduate research assistant and working as a software developer. Okay. Do we have anyone here that works for um, an EHR or HIE vendor? Usually someone works for Epic. Just walking around the street, I usually find that. No? OK. Well, um, let me uh, go ahead and get started with the presentation. Um, for technical purposes, um, I think that we're going to have people who are watching remotely um, hold their questions until the end, because they'll be able to text them in. Um, but for you all here, uh, you know, feel free to interrupt and ask me questions throughout. Um, so today we're going to be talking about HIE Texas. How many of you are familiar with electronic health information exchanges? Yeah? Everyone? OK, good. Um, are people familiar with the local health information exchange that operates here in Houston called Greater Houston Health Connect? Got one hand back there. Um, since you guys are already familiar with it, can anyone tells me, tell me what does an electronic health information exchange do? And if no one offers, I'm going to call on someone. <laughs> Pretty easy. This guy's smiling. I'm going to ask him. It's a community, community exchange of shared data amongst the community. 
a community exchange of shared data uh, amongst the community, yes. Um, that, that is a very good, uh, simple answer. Basically, there are many different ways to set up an uh, electronic health information exchange, um, but that is generally what we're getting at. We're sharing information amongst a community, and that community can vary in size. We have local HIEs here in the state, and we're going to show you pictures in the map later to make it easier, that service a specific region. Greater Houston Health Connect um, serves the Greater Houston area, as you might have guessed. Um, in the San Antonio area, we have Healthcare Access San Antonio. Um, in Austin, we have the Integrated Care Collaboration. What HIE Texas does is it connects all of these local HIEs together. So a patient's health information can follow them wherever they go, not just within a community, but across communities. And then we also provide a gateway for these local HIEs to the eHealth Exchange and soon other national um, data sharing uh, networks that will allow the patient's health information to follow them wherever they go in the country. So HI, oh, we got a question right here. So, and, and before I answer that, can you tell me again, what was the name of the organization? Hope Clinic? Hope Clinic. Uh, so okay. Um, so, the question was, um, and they've asked me to repeat all these, um, is for a place like Hope Clinic um, that serves refugees and other people, um, is it more difficult for them to participate in electronic health information exchange? Um, can I ask, do they have an electronic health record system? And do you, who is, do you know what vendor that is? I forgot the name of it. It wasn't something I'd ever heard of before. <laughs> That's the first good first indicator. Um, uh, generally, I'm going to give you my lawyer answer. Uh, it depends. Um, it depends on the data standards that they're using, whether they can build the interface to the electronic health information exchange. Um, we would love for all EHR systems to be completely ubiquitous and be able to just talk to each other much in the same way that you have a phone and you're on one network, your friend's on another network, you guys can still talk to each other. Um, but HIE plays the middleman um, and all HIEs and all EHRs have varying um, sophistications of uh, data standards and interface services. So um, my question is... It's up to the HIE and the EHR vendor for that company to work together to be able to build the interface. And there are often issues on both sides of that interface. So HIE Texas is operated by the Texas Health Services Authority. Um, this is my employer. We are a quasi-governmental agency. We were created by the Texas legislature in 2007 as a public-private partnership. Um, we will become, due to legislation this past session, a fully private entity um, beginning in 2021. And we've always set ourselves up that way. We know that data flows in both the private sector and the public sector. So right now we're serving as that meeting point between the two of them to build all these connections. Um, but we've always operated on market principles and believe that the services should create value and people should pay for that value if they see it. So we've operated much like a regular company that um, has a lot of government regulations guiding what it's supposed to do. Um, in 2009, we got a flood of money come to Texas through the High Tech Act. Anyone know what High Tech Act stands for? I think I see someone mouthing it over here. Yeah, the Health Information for Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act. Um, it'll be great to recite at parties. Now you full, fully know it. Um, so that was part of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. Um, it sent a flood of money to states to build their H HIE infrastructure and also created incentive and disincentive dollars for um, healthcare providers to adopt EHR systems. It's supposed to turn on the lights, get everyone connected through certain guidelines. 
Texas as a whole got $28.8 million. Um, a lot of that went to local health information exchanges in the state. Some went to us at the state level, um, and others were for things like training a health IT workforce. Um, that money came through the Texas Health and Human Services Commission. I believe that you're going to hear next week and the week after that um, uh, from two different people who work with the Health and Human Services Commission. They'll be able to give you a pretty good idea um, of the HIE operations that they're conducting at the state level. Um, we work with them, or we worked with them to support planning and development and implementation of local HIE networks. That was through this grant program through the High Tech Act um, called the State HIE Cooperative Agreement Program. Um, that ended in March 2014, but we still have a good working relationship with the commission and we work on HIE activities and seek other grants when they become available. So, nope. Oh, Health and Human Services Commission. And um, specifically, uh, they house our Medicaid system. And uh, Ram Das and um, Jason Phipps next week, either next week or next time, um, are the ones who are going to be speaking to you more directly about what they do there. Um, so in Texas, um, I've kind of described it a little bit already, but we have what's called a network of networks. Um, HIE can be set up in several different ways. Um, there are a lot of states who just have one state level HIE, and it's a centralized data repository that everyone's just putting information into the pot, getting information out of the pot. That's not so popular in Texas. Um, as with just about anything else that is going to involve some political step to it, there has to be grassroots involved. Um, you have to let the community decide. Um, which is exactly what we did, because what might work for a community in the sharing of electronic health information in Houston might not necessarily work in Dallas, and those are even pretty comparable areas. And what works for either of those major metropolitan areas definitely won't work out in the rural areas of West Texas. So, um, for instance, uh, <clears throat> Greater Houston Health Connect, they're a completely federated system meaning there is no centralized data repository. They are, all the information resides with the healthcare provider, and they're exchanging it through the Greater Houston Health Connect system. There's no big pot that everyone's getting the information out of. HASA, um, Healthcare Access San Antonio, on the other hand, they do have a centralized data repository. Um, the, there are kind of pros and cons to both approaches, but it's the, it's the approach that they decided on as a community and each of these local HIEs um, has a board that is made up of very diverse healthcare providers and, and other people from the community to help them decide how they wanted to set that up. So we have three key goals at HIE Texas. The first is a decentralized approach, network of networks, like we just talked about. The second is creating greater efficiencies from the state level for our local HIEs. Um, we have a hub and spoke model. We can reach many endpoints with one connection. As we said, um, we provide for the lo local HIEs one gateway to the eHealth exchange so they can exchange information on the national level. This saves Greater Houston Health Connect from having to create their own gateway and HASA from having to create their own, and ICC from having to create their own. Instead, they all just create one gateway to us, and we provide that one gateway out. We provide a consistent legal framework for the exchange of information. Um, I know, because I worked a lot on that legal framework. Um, it kind of, there are many different uh, legal agreements that we have that I believe that we'll talk about later, but it enables entities participating in statewide health information exchange to all sign on to one legal framework instead of having to do one-off agreements with every single person they exchange information with, which could be an exponential number of agreements and an exponential number of lawyers. Um, and we have automated consent management. Um, consent management, um, basically, all of our different local HIEs have different policies for how patients provide their consent to their information being shared through an HIE. 
Some are an opt-in model, meaning you have to take an action as the patient for your information to be shared. <clears throat> Some are an opt-out, meaning your information will be shared through the HIE unless you take an action for it to not be shared through the HIE. And then building trust. Um, there are not a lot of regulations in Texas or at the federal level specifically addressing health information exchanges. There are a lot of general healthcare regulations that must be complied with, like such as HIPAA and similar state um, privacy laws at the state level. But there are, there are no laws out there saying you, health information exchange, have to do this or report to this board. So we knew that we needed to police ourselves in, unless we wanted to get really, really regulated by the state or the federal government. So we came up with um, our HIE accreditation program before a local HIE or a private HIE onboards to our state system, we have an accreditation that they go through that makes sure that they're doing everything right from a business standpoint, from a technical standpoint, from a privacy and security standpoint, and just other general requirements to make sure that they're operating properly and can exchange information properly. Secure Texas is a privacy and security certification that we were directed to implement by the Texas legislature in 2011. This isn't just for local health health information exchanges. This is for all covered entities in Texas, as that term is defined in Texas, which is pretty broad. It's almost anyone who has protected health information. Um, but that allows basically end users of these electronic systems to um, certify their past compliance with state and federal medical privacy and security law. Again, th these are voluntary things that people are policing themselves so they don't get over-regulated out of business. Uh, the local HIE landscape. Um, when we started the local HIE grant program, um, or when HHSC started it, we assisted them with it. There were 16 local HIEs in the state. Um, but it's not like um, other types of state level Medicaid or other operations where the state is carved up into regions and they stay within those regions. We let them define their own regions which turned out to be really interesting because if you laid down a map of the referral patterns in Texas on top of the map for local health information exchanges, it lines up pretty nicely because that's just kind of how it happened organically. When you're defining what your service area is going to be as local health information exchange, you're finding that provider X wants to make sure that the, the patients that he or she refers people to or gets referrals from are in that network. So it just kind of happens that they organically define their own boundaries like that. Um, in the beginning, I think there were about four who started with the planning process and realized that they weren't going to have people in their community that were going to support them going forward. Um, so that brought us down to 12. Um, and then from, from the 12 to the 8, we've had a lot of people kind of merge through competition. Um, there are there was, I think, two or three HIEs competing here in the Houston area. And either they just kind of fell off and Greater Houston um, picked up their clients or they made some more formal kind of merger. We just had our, actually, um, DFW HIE um, called the North Texas Capital Healthcare Partnership merge with the San Antonio-based HIE. Um, and now San Antonio is up in DFW trying to go to different healthcare providers and connect them up. Um, but they all receive startup funding from the state through the grant program we talked about earlier. Um, they have diverse governing boards. They're all nonprofits. Um, they uh, exchange clinical summary documents. Um, and many are trying to add other value-added services. Um, we are moving towards an era where electronic health record systems are going to be able to talk to each other. There are national um, trade associations such as Commonwealth um, or Care Equality that are getting all of these EHR vendors to agree to speak the same language so they can all just talk to each other. <clears throat> so it's going to make it, I don't want to say more difficult, 
health information exchanges that play the middleman right now in that scenario. They're going to have to figure out more than just clinical summary exchange of how they're going to compete. Um, a lot of them provide analytic services, population health services. Um, they might do unique things within the community. I know the Greater Houston Health Connect um, participates in a program where they help um, triage, I guess would be the right word. Um, people are picked up in an ambulance and that it's um, for an emergency service, they'll help direct them to the right way. If it's a non-emergency service, they'll help direct them through another way through their local HIE platform. That's just not something that Commonwealth can do or other people can do, but it's just really kind of an interesting time. The landscape is changing. Um, more people are filling gaps um, where we had gaps in um, electronic HIE. Um, we have a very diverse group of people participating, all the way from small physician offices to large hospital systems to health plans. Any questions? I feel like I'm just talking a lot. Uh, um, so, so the, these uh, community uh, networks for HIE, they were funded by, uh, initially from the state of Louisiana, and then they were funded by the state of Louisiana, and then they were funded by the state of Louisiana, and then they were funded by the state of Louisiana, and then they were funded by the state of Louisiana. That is a good question. And it's, um, so the question is, how does an HIE generate revenue going forward? And I assume that that means after they've run out of their grant money. Um, that has been a big question that's always on everyone's mind and is, is HIE sustainable? Yes, it is. Um, and we're finding as we move forward that some HIEs have figured out how to do that. Greater Houston has. Um, some HIEs have not. And like I said, we've dwindled from 16 down to eight. That wasn't all just mergers and acquisitions. Some of it was they just couldn't get the support in the community and couldn't figure out how to get the ball rolling. Um, but they uh, get participation fees um, from those doctors, from those hospitals, from those health plans, um, and that supports their system. Others might have angel investors. Um, other, they're just constantly thinking of different ways that they can add value to the community um, and that's what's going to support them. So finally, pictures. I'm a pictures person. I've been talking about all this stuff. Um, so here's where our local HIEs cover the state. Um, you can see those colored regions. That's where our community-based local HIEs cover the state. Here's Greater Houston Health Connect. They service this region over here. Where you see those stripes, that's where we have a little bit of slight overlap between local HIEs. Um, these dots right here with the letters, these are private HIE networks. Um, they can just service their own network. They can connect themselves to a local HIE network, and that way their private community can be plug plugged into the public community as a whole. Um, so we've seen this landscape change somewhat over the last four or five years, um, but uh, we're, we're really trying to work on, on this space right here because there's a lot of rural health care providers. A lot of them don't have the EHR systems that they need to to connect to local HIE. They may not have the community involvement that they need to stand up a local HIE on their own. One of the things that we're trying to work on with the uh, HIE covering the San Antonio area, HASA, is for them to expand their services out into these rural areas. Um, they kind of coincide where you see some of these private networks already. Um, but the idea is to get the entire state going to where they have query-based electronic health information exchange. And when I say query-based, I differentiate that from direct, there's direct and there's query. Direct is just pushing information. You can send an information to someone after they perhaps requested it from you. Query based is where much more akin to Google. There's information out there on the internet. You can just go get it. Um, and that's where uh, you have robust health information exchange. That's what helps patients more. That's what allows information to help um, patients have their information follow them in closer to real time. So constantly working on solutions for what we used to call the white space. Um, we stopped calling it that. 
And the reason that it's called that is because of maps just like this. There are other states that have their own white space. It's because there's always a different color that signifies where there's service and the lack of color is where there's no service. But um, that doesn't play well when you're talking to like a state legislature or something about activity going on in the state. They think white space. They think that TV that's making that snow thing. And um, we have another yeah, question right here. Am I reading that right, that hospice covers uh, Dallas-Fort Worth? They are expanding into Dallas-Fort Worth. We used to have the North Texas Accountable Healthcare Partnership up here. Um, they decided to close their operations. Um, we have a question. Yes. Can yeah, me? I can. Um, my name is Coyote, and uh, I want to ask, do you have any Lego brick work? Um, thank God you are a law person. Uh, do you have any Lego brick work for the functionality of this uh, HIV? Eagle. Eagle framework? Eagle. Oh, legal framework. Do we have a legal framework for the functionality of HIE? Yes, we do. Um, I'll talk about it a little bit right now because I cannot remember if I have a slide on it later. Um, uh, what we have is at the state level, we have what's called the state level trust agreement. <clears throat> and that's what I was talking about before where all of these local HIEs. Do you need me to speak up or do you need me to speak somewhere? Is this better? Hello? Uh -oh. You have been muted. I think that means I'm unmuted. Um, so the question, starting over, is uh, is there a legal framework for these HIEs in the state? Um, yes, there is a very robust legal framework um, that uh, has come after years of negotiation. Um, at the highest level, at the national level, what we have is the Data Use and Reciprocal Support Agreement. It's called the DERSA. It lays out all the rules that participants in the e-health exchange are going to abide by for exchanging information. It lays out your duty to respond. It lays out what happens if you suffer a breach while exchanging information through that system. It lays out all of the rules of the road for exchanging information. Everyone who participates in the e-health exchange has to sign this document. And if they're a state like Texas that is a network of networks, they have to make sure that all of their sub-levels also agree to that. So what we did to solve this issue is we created the state level trust agreement, where we take all the provisions that are in the DERSA that need to flow down to our sub-participants, and we put it in our state level trust agreement. The local HIEs and private HIE networks eventually that sign on, they sign that state level trust agreement they get their participants to agree to the same terms. It's making it to where all the requirements are flowing down and there are less and less legal documents that need to be signed. If all of these participants had to exchange or had to sign documents with each other, we would have an exponential number of one-off agreements. That's the beauty of a trust agreement. We're all agreeing to one rule of the road that we're gonna play by. But that's not the only agreement that's involved. So that flows down. Who we're servicing at the very bottom level there, those are the doctors, those are the hospitals, those are the HIPAA-covered entities. And how many people here are familiar with HIPAA? OK, good. Um, so HIPAA-covered entities are health plans, healthcare providers, and healthcare clearinghouses. When they engage a contractor or a subcontractor to either maintain or exchange or transmit protected health information on their behalf, they've created what's called a business associate relationship. And they have to get that contractor to sign a business associate agreement or a BAA. If that business associate delegates any of those tasks to a subcontractor, 
they also have to sign an agreement. So the, for example, the physician that's participating in Greater Houston Health Connect will have Greater Houston Health Connect sign a business associate agreement. We are the subcontractor even for Greater Houston Health Connect, so we'll sign a business associate agreement with them. So that's another legal agreement that's involved. So we've covered, oops, we got a question in the back. question about patient consent management. Do, when a hospital joins this exchange program, the integration part, do they ask patients to give them consent for every single visit? Uh, so um, does a hospital or other healthcare provider need to get patient consent at every single visit? Or is it, do they just grab the consent one time and then that's good for forever? Um, so that is a bit of a, a tricky question because when you talk about consent, we, it means a few different things. Um, consent, as far as state and federal medical privacy and security laws are concerned, um, you need to get that consent probably each time depending on the purpose of exchanging information. But if it's just for treatment or payment or healthcare operations, I'll, the acronym for that is TPO, if you ever hear that, you don't actually have to get consent for the patient. You can just exchange that information. And then there's the more specific consent of consent to share information specifically through an HIE. There are no regulations around that. Think of HIE as just a different medium of exchange. It's a fax machine that's a lot, lot better than a fax machine. You don't need their specific permission to do it through that medium of exchange. That doesn't mean, though, that local HIEs and healthcare providers don't work together to get that consent anyways, because it's a new technology. Um, people are really sensitive to that, um, and they want patients to be informed of how their information is being exchanged. So. Um, in terms of whether they get it every single time or whether they get it just the one time and then that's good to capture all the subsequent visits, that's kind of up to them, but there's no regulation that's driving that. So if they ask for consent for every single visit for exchanging patient data in an HIE, let's say one patient goes to hospital A and give consent to them to do that. And if they go to another one and not giving the consent, what would happen? I mean. You have their consent once, but now in the second visit, they just... Um, so what happens, uh, I'm going to repeat your question back. Let's say, again, we're going to use Greater Houston Health Connect. You've got two hospitals in Greater Houston Health Connect. Patient goes to hospital A, says, I give my consent for you to exchange my information through the Greater Houston Health Connect. Subsequently goes to a different visit at hospital B and does not give that consent. Again, there are no specific regulations around consent to health information exchange. But if specifically what they said when they got to hospital B is, I want to opt out of exchanging my information, meaning I don't want to exchange it anymore, then they could either do that probably directly to Greater Houston Health Connect or health, Greater Houston Health Connect has it worked out with that hospital that if you get an opt out request, you'll send it to us and we'll stop exchanging the information. So the Greater Houston Health Connect holds those consent opt ins and opt outs. Yeah. Are responsible for it. Correct. And different regions handle it differently. Um, like I said, some of them it's opt in, some of them it's opt out. Some of them might have something in between where it's just for general information it's opt out, but for sensitive information. Um, such as like HIV tests or something like that. Um, it may be opt-in, but they're, again, they're going to have to have the technology to be able to parse that data um, if they're doing hybrid consent like that. I hope that helps answer your question. Okay. Um, one last legal agreement or group of legal agreements that I'll say. We talked about the rules of the road with trust agreements. We've talked about the rules for privacy and security, um, the business associate agreement. Then there's the business side of things. How much am I going to pay as a healthcare provider to participate in Greater Houston Health Connect? Or if I'm Greater Houston Health Connect, how much am I going to pay to participate in HIE Texas? Um, what are the rules for payment? How, when will this renew? All, those, all the business side of things. Um, so that's called a participation agreement. 
So generally, you'll, you'll see three types of agreements involved, uh, a trust agreement, a business associate agreement, and a participation agreement. And it's a very, it, it may seem like a lot of things with requirements flowing both up and down the chart, but um, those are generally the ones you're going to see. Any questions before I move on? Uh, so this is actually what I was talking about earlier. Uh, rural West Texas HIE planning. This is what I said that we're working on with Healthcare Access San Antonio. We contracted with Healthcare Access San Antonio for them to develop a business and operational plan about how we're going to get the lights turned on in these communities that are not currently per participating in um, HIE. Um, they have uh, completed that uh, business and operational plan, and now we're just kind of in a wait and see mode to whether the funds are available um, and whether it's going to be um, able to be done, whether we can carry out that business and operational plan, um, and whether there's buy-in in the communities. But they've laid the groundwork for it to happen. Um, but it's, uh, like I said, it's, it's difficult out there. Um, because electronic health information exchange isn't always their number one priority in rural Texas. Um, they operate on razor thin budgets. They don't have the same technologies because of that budget. Um, and it just made me more difficult uh, to, to do these things. Um, but as a quasi governmental agency that's charged with the electronic expansion of electronic health information exchange across the state, we have a duty to continually make sure that we're providing an option for this area of the state. So we're always looking at different ways to get them to participate. Um, so this is like just kind of some conceptual art of uh, what we do at the state level. This is HIE Texas. These are our local health information exchanges. As you can see, oh, we need to update this one. Um, the dotted lines one are the ones that have not connected yet but plan to. Uh, the solid lines have connected. Um, HASA is like right there. I, I think we're in our very, very final stages of uh, testing development. Um, legally speaking, they've signed all the agreements to onboard and everything, but I think they're just like maybe five out of six steps or something like that of getting technically onboarded. Um, these are all the services that we provide at the state level. Clinical document exchange, so the information can travel from a um, primary care physician in Austin, and then they refer them to a specialist here in Houston, which is pretty common. Um, we have one or two specialists that operate here, from what I understand, um, and not just stay within communities. But electronically, they can travel throughout the state. We um, provide patient consent management, so we can recognize the hypothetical that we talked about earlier with the patient opting in and opting out, hospital A, hospital B. Like I said, different regions have different consent policies. And there needs to be a way to recognize those differences when information is exchanged across the state. We provide a gateway to the eHealth Exchange. Um, so there's another picture I think shows this better, but this looks cleaner. But these are all our state level and local health information exchanges. We provide them another gateway to share it across the nation. Um, and then we have a federated trust framework, and that's our um, state level trust agreement that we were talking about before. Uh, so we've recently started to develop these. Um, as we become more operational over the last like two or three years or so, um, it, it wasn't good enough to tell people, hey, we're working on it with these local HIEs or we're working on it with these national connections or other connections. Um, people wanted to know specifically what stage are they in. Um, and I'm going to try my best to really explain, but um, remember, I'm the lawyer. I'm not the, I'm not the technical side person. Um, but there are preparation steps that you have to go through 
to even get to the point of doing testing in the test environment and testing in the production environment. So this little Harvey ball, is what I learned this is called, um, represents where you are in those steps. Um, if you, you see, for example, um, we have Greater Houston Health Connect. This is the status of their connectivity to the eHealth Exchange. Over here, this is Greater Houston Health Connect status of their connectivity to other local health information exchanges in Texas. So as you can see, in, for, for their connectivity to local HIEs in Texas, they've completed all of the test phases in both directions, meaning they can send information and they can receive information. They've done that in the test environment and they've done that in the production environment. So they're, they can exchange information with the integrated care collaboration as soon as Healthcare Access San Antonio gets all of its steps in green here, they'll be able to fully exchange information with them as well. But then it's a little bit of a different story when you're talking about ability to exchange information to entities outside of the state through the eHealth Exchange Gateway. Um, as you can see these arrows, Greater Houston Health Connect can receive everything and they've accomplished that in both the test environment, production environment, but because of the vendor change that they need to go through, um, there's still some steps that need to be accomplished for them to send information out of the state. Um, but this is just a kind of good visual depiction of where we are with all our local HIEs. We're really hoping um, through a Medicaid interactive planning document um, that we're working on with the Health and Human Services Commission, there should be some more funding available soon um, to help mitigate the cost of connecting these local HIEs to HIE Texas. Um, so that is kind of, these are some of the smaller HIEs that you don't see any activity yet. They're doing a lot of activity within their local community, but this is showing their activity across the state. Um, so hopefully we can get some more funding to help cut down on those interface costs um, of building that gateway. We have a question here. Um, yeah, uh, the patient uh, consents to have their medical information exchanged. Is there a mechanism in place where the patients have no word who wants to exchange this? Uh, very good question. If a patient consents to have their medical information exchanged, is there a mechanism by which for them to know where it's been exchanged with? Uh, yes. That is very specifically laid out in HIPAA. Um, uh, it's uh, audit logs, um, and uh, you can track that. They can request what's called an accounting of disclosures. Um, and you can go to a healthcare provider, and you can say, hey, I want to know all the instances in which you disclose my health information um, over the course of the last three or six years. And the only reason I'm wavering on that answer is because that is the only part of HIPAA that is still in the... Uh, proposed rulemaking phase. Um, the High Tech Act updated HIPAA, um, and I think that's where industry and government could not really agree on what industry can do to track that information and for what purposes. Um, so it's just kind of sitting out there in a proposed rule. It's not a final rule, meaning that um, the Office for Civil Rights, the arm of um, the Department of Health and Human Services that enforces HIPAA can't come in and say, this is a final rule, but you should still do it. You should still ensure that your EHR system or your HIE system has the ability to audit and track exactly where the information goes and the purpose for which it went there. No problem. Any other questions before we move on? We got about 15 minutes left. I know I want to be um, respectful of everyone's time around the lunch hour, um, so I might uh, shoot through some of these. Um, the only thing I want to talk about on this slide is this is Texas's connection to other entities that are connected um, to the eHealth Exchange. A lot of people thought when they first talked about the eHealth Exchange is you're just going to build an interface to the eHealth Exchange and you automatically have a connection to other entities that are connected to it. And that's not the case. You have to test that connection with that entity through the eHealth Exchange. And we wanted to be very diligent in making sure that we could actually do that. And you can see there are varying degrees of success. 
There are other states and other entities that say, we have a connection to the Yelp Exchange, so we're good. But they haven't really proved that out. We have a question here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the question slash comment um, I'll say is uh, she had an experience with her husband with the VA and having to bounce around to different facilities within Texas um, and just their kind of inability to exchange information. Um, this is why you have to test out and prove these connections. The VA, they're just a different animal. Um, they operate on different data standards. And we're actually um, working with them very intensely this week um, to try to move that forward. Because that, that is a really big issue. A lot of veterans need um, health care. Outside of yeah. the area, and they can't get in any right. records. In, in, even in Texas, in the other cities, right. not, not at all. <laughs> um, so we're not the only ones that are experiencing this with the, with the VA. Um, uh, we're, we're trying really hard to push that through because that's very important. And being quasi-governmental agency, it's a very uh, politically sensitive issue as well um, that we want to make sure that we're servicing veterans because we do have a lot of them that reside here in the Texas area. Um, so any, any other questions on our connections to entities outside of the state through the e-health exchange gateway? Um, also, information flows from healthcare providers to state level entities. All I'm gonna say from this chart is HIE Texas is ready and fully able to connect with any state agency. So when you have two sides to a connection, um, sometimes one side holds that up. Um, one of us is ready. Uh, so. We're planning on connecting. We've done some testing with the Department of State Health Services. We had legislation passed even this past session <clears throat> when their lawyers weren't specifically OK with, there's nothing in statute that says specifically that this information can be exchanged via HIE. It says it can be exchanged A, B, C. It even said in there, or other electronic means, but they weren't comfortable with that. Lawyers are just the worst, I know. Um, we got that changed in statute to specifically say information can be exchanged via health information exchange. A year later, we're still working on the testing to get that done. Um, and I'll still reiterate, if they wanted to go all the other levels, we would be ready to do that like that. But it's, yes, go ahead. Okay. Well, earlier on, I, I happened to be in the last semester uh, with the school, and uh, I, uh, I had uh, uh, Steve Eichner, he is the director of HIV policy in the health department. My job, I am the e electronic lab reporting analyst. Okay. And HL7 analyst for the state. So, now, we, we are working right now with Greater Connect uh, on, we're working uh, with them to get uh, one of the one facility in Houston in, into production. And as I said, there are a lot of bottlenecks here and there with uh, the SFTP in space. So um, my question is, uh, I mean, we would like to work, especially probably I'd like to talk with you offline later, you know, about how we can really work together, you know, because there are a lot of facilities that want to get into, uh, to submit public health data uh, electronically, and uh, they don't have, I mean, the cost of them getting uh, an interface machine is really high, so uh, I don't know what you have to say to uh, uh, this. 
Well, first of all, tell Steve I said hello. Um, I believe they gave an update in our last meeting that they're very actively working on testing with us, which is interesting. Um, yes, it is very expensive to build interfaces, which is exactly why we're proposing the method that we have. A lot of providers already connect to local health information exchanges to exchange information with each other, to exchange information for other purposes. They have to build an interface to do that, and that can be expensive. What they don't have the money to do is go out and build another interface for another purpose and another interface for another purpose, because those do get to be expensive. The reason that we have this legislation and the reason why it's so important to have this one funnel connecting in at the state level is to save money on down the line. It makes it more efficient. Um, but yeah, that is, uh, that is very interesting to hear. Um, and I would, uh, I would love to connect with you offline to hear about the specific testing that's happening directly, apparently, with Greater Houston Health Connect. And we also have an issue also a gray area that uh, I'm looking at. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know the legal implication of all those. And as I said, it is broken. You need to give me a number of you can really talk of that. Um, I would probably have Steve direct all those questions to us. Again, tell him that's very interesting. I heard that. Um, and tell him I said hello. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to move forward. Um, we are at six minutes out. Um, I have some information about our local HIE uh, accreditation program. I don't think I need to go too much into that, um, but we partnered with the Electronic Health Network Accreditation Commission, I believe is what that's called. Yep. Um, and it just helps us make sure that any HIE that onboards to our services are doing everything in the right way. Then we have our privacy and security certification program um, called Secure Texas. Um, this is for hospitals, doctors' offices, anyone who maintains or exchanges PHI in Texas um, as a way to show their certification for their past compliance with state and federal medical privacy and security laws. Um, this is getting to be a bigger issue. Um, as you guys might have heard, there were one or two breaches of healthcare information last year. And by one or two, I mean like a gajillion times more than one or two. Um, so people who contract with entities to handle health information, they want to know that they're doing everything right. So it's really hard for them to just have the resources to go in and just audit that um, company to make sure they're doing everything right and keep a close eye on them. They can't just take their word for it. So they are really pushing for people to have certifications like this to show, hey, we're adhering to everything that we need to do from a privacy and security standpoint point to safeguard protected health information. Um, this is some of the legislation that we talked about. Uh, this is legislation that moves us from a private, public-private partnership to a private entity in five years from now. Um, this is 2641. This is what allows the bi-directional exchange of information with the Department of State Health Services. Um, it also ensures that um, the Health and Human Services Commission, that any data standards that they implement um, are according to national data standards. We don't want to create a one-off kind of solution for the state that doesn't jive for how people are doing things around the country. Um, it also creates a small safe harbor for physicians. Um, a lot of physicians were uncomfortable about what happens if I'm a provider, I submit health information to a health information exchange, and then that HIE or someone else participating in that HIE does something wrong, um, am I going to be on the hook for that? Generally, that in, that's handled through a business associate agreement. They wanted something that was in state law. So they got something in state law that just makes it abundantly clear. And it, really, the point of it is to make providers feel more comfortable about exchanging information as they should. Um, 
Senate Bill 195 has to do with the state's prescription drug monitoring program. I'm not going to really get into that right now in the interest of time. Um, some of the challenges that we've talked about throughout today is sustainability for HIEs, interface costs, implementation delays, um, physician and other provider participation, um, integrating HIE into the EHR workflow. Um, that's an important one we haven't really hit on the head, but physicians, other healthcare providers, they have their EHR. They have limited time with their patient. They need to be able to interact with the patient. They need to be able to access their patient's information quickly. What doesn't help with that is when you're in your EHR and then to access the information in electronic health information exchange is you have to go somewhere else to log into a separate portal. Because that, I mean, it may not sound <laughs> like a lot of work, but when you're seeing patient after patient after patient in a day, um, you need to do everything you can to streamline it. So you need to make sure that that HIE information, all that other information you're grabbing on the patient displays nicely within that EHR workflow, a separate tab, or within the screen or something like that. So it's just an interoperability and user interface issue that is constantly being worked through. Um, I think right now I'll just open it up to questions. I think we have a couple minutes for them, but like I said, I want to be respectful of your times. Any questions from in the classroom? from the special voices above. <laughs> there was an acronym a couple slides earlier, D DSHS, what was that? Uh, DSHS, that's the Department of State Health Services. That's the um, state level organization um, or state agency that the nice gentleman uh, whose ominous voice you heard earlier works for. Coyote, yeah, okay. And then question here. So I guess, and just so I have this question straight, it's, it's your EHR vendor that is telling you? They want to do an online, they want you to give them the data, they, they said they give them all their data, but for the patient to show a spreadsheet, but it has to be on an online repository, they're not going to just send it to them. Yeah, that, that's something um, that I won't go too much into the legal implications and border on giving legal advice, but I would say a good place to start looking is the business associate agreement that you have with that vendor. And do we have a question in the back, or is someone just stretching back there? Uh, no. no. Okay. Well, if we don't have anything else, um, thank you guys for allowing me to come talk to your offer an hour today. Um, and thank you for all the really good questions. I really enjoy it when.